Hey, what's up? John Sonmez here from simpleprogrammer.com. So I get this question, and I get this question a lot about how to compete with cheap programmers. And it's not meant to be offensive in any way. It's just an honest question. This is really something that you have to worry about if you're a developer, especially if you're a freelancer today, especially if you're using platforms like Upwork and, and whatnot. So this question is from Robert. And Robert says, hello, I want to be a web developer and also a freelancer. There are a lot of cheap web developers from India and other countries. What should I do different if I want to be better and also be hired? Should I know more languages, more frameworks? I also want to be better paid than them. What will make me different? So I definitely have a lot of opinion on this simply because I've been on both ends of this as a software developer, as a freelancer, and especially now as someone who hires a lot of people off of Upwork, right? I, I spend a lot of time, I hire programmers off of there. I just hired a programmer off of there and and you know for, for fairly cheap and, and got a good job done on it and I'll tell you what I'm looking for I'll tell you what makes a difference I'll tell you why you can compete with that guy from India that's charging five dollars an hour to do PHP development and he knows 15 different frameworks and programming languages and there, there's it's really seems hard to compete with him the biggest thing that you can do okay bar none is to communicate effectively right this is why this channel exists uh, if you if you want to read more about this I mean I'm, I'll talk about this briefly in the video definitely check out my book if you haven't already soft skills software developers life manual but but the key thing is is communication skills and the ability to instill confidence in the person that's that's going to hire you right so if I put out a rec on Upwork and I'm looking for a developer I had I had a job out for someone to convert my uh, uh, Photoshop. So I did a 99 designs design for a, a landing page for one of my, for my book, for actually for my new book. You can check that one out. Actually, it's called uh, the so Complete Software Developer's Career Guide, which actually should be out now by the time that you're watching this video. And, or, or maybe, yeah, it should be out by now. Uh, go check that out and you can check out the landing page and the trailer and everything there. But I had someone design that and then I had to hire someone on Upwork to convert the Photoshop to, to HTML, to the web, right, to, and, and get it working in WordPress, right? So stuff that I could probably do, but this is the kind of stuff that I hire out now. Not, not super programming work, right? Not, not any in-depth technical thing, but the thing, what I was looking for was not, I didn't go and look, when I'm, when I'm evaluating the people that apply for the job, I didn't go and look and say, what kind of skills do they have? I didn't look and see how much years of experience of PHP or HTML or web development they had. I looked at a couple of things. I looked at their portfolio to see if they've done work that chal that's challenging, but before I even looked at that, I looked at how they responded and communicated to me. Because I made a pretty detailed job description saying what I wanted and some of the pitfalls and some of the, the concerns that I had and there were certain people that responded that addressed all of my concerns that said look man I understand they, they got me right they're like okay I see what you're trying to do here and you you want to make sure that this is done right you did this on 99 designs you want this to be pretty much pixel perfect you want to put this in a in a content builder so you can edit this okay this is how I can do this I'll make sure that I get this done for you and no problem don't worry I understand what you're talking about what your requirement is about being able to edit it because you're going to need to be able to change it and you don't want to have to mark up the HTML we can put it into a, a page builder that you have on your site on your WordPress site right and described all the stuff and alleviated all my concerns and so those those people that that did that Th those were the people that I looked at strongly and I ended up hiring, right? Because, because they demonstrated more than the technical proficiency. Because I know that if someone communicates at that level, if they look at what needs to be done and they can tell me where there's going to be issues, if they can tell me how they're going to execute on that and, and re regurgitate to me my own concerns on the project and the things that I've described in there and and actually like take the requirements and and break that down and say okay this is what and even have some questions for me that means that they get it right I trust them I trust their competency because that's an expert level of competency and that's someone who's gonna deliver on the work I'm not looking for the cheapest person in that case right whereas a lot of people responded to that job right and respond to a lot of jobs I put out for programmers or anything on Upwork and they say yes sir I can do it 
I'm your man, right? And in, in, in Upwork, you can put questions and you can ask certain questions that they have to fill out. And so I ask always these evaluation questions, asking them about, have you done this before? Or what do you think about this issue? Or, you know, and I ask some questions to filter people out. And there will be, there will be developers from India and from other countries that will just say, yes, sir, I've done it. Or give me yes, yes, one word answers. Or say, no worries, no worries, man. I can handle it for you. And that doesn't instill a lot of confidence, right? There's no way I'm ever hiring one of those guys unless they're like two bucks an hour and, I'm like, and I hire someone else and I just hire them just to see what they end up doing. But I have no trust and no confidence in them. So, so and, and the difference can be huge, right? Because one of these guys could be charging five, 10 bucks an hour and actually the guy that I ended up hiring, I think ended up charging 35 bucks an hour or 40 bucks an hour and I've hired people that are 100 bucks an hour on Upwork, why? because they communicate, even though they're competition, even though there were people that had more skills listed on their profile or on their resume, even though th that was the case and, and those people were charging $20 an hour, I might hire the $100 person because I know that they are gonna communicate because they understand the project, because they've, they've done that. So in summary, this is, all, this is what I'm saying, is basically this. If you wanna compete with those guys, don't try and compete with them on technical skill. That's silly, that's ridiculous. These guys can spend so much time improving their technical skills or putting all this stuff on their resume and you know, if you're in a third world country, right? I mean, some of you are, right? So if you are, you know, if you don't have a job and your only source of income is Upwork and if making 10 bucks an hour is gonna let you live pretty nicely, you can spend a whole bunch of time learning technologies and getting all this technical knowledge, but the application of that, the ability to communicate and actually execute on the project, that's what's more important and that's what I'm looking for and that's what a lot of people that want to work with you because it doesn't matter, right? I mean, there's tons of people that have the technical skills, but if I have to spend my time, if I have to spend two extra days communicating with you because you misunderstood it wrong or giving you explicit instructions because you don't get it, that's more expensive. I'd rather pay someone twice, three times what you're charging and have it done right and trust them and not have to meddle in it as much, right? And that's how most entrepreneurs, that's how most businesses think. So, so that's what you gotta think about. Don't think about competing on the technical level. Have the technical competency, but when it comes down to applying for a job or soliciting prospects for the work that you're gonna do, Make it very clear, Here's, I'll give you some real simple explanation. One, make it as clear as possible that you understand what they're trying to do, regurgitate it back to them, paraphrase it, and make it very clear that you understand what they want. That's the one, that's the biggest thing that's gonna help you more than anything else. As soon as you read someone who, who does that, who responds to a job, you, you get this side, like, oh, he gets it, okay? You, you have that confidence. Number two, communicate what the, the expert level stuff, what the problems you have, questions you have, you know, how you plan on doing things, implementation details that show that you're, you're not just bullshitting. You're not just saying, oh yeah, I can do this job, I can do anything. You actually have thought about it and, and, and have communicated that. Those are gonna be the biggest things uh, that, that are gonna make the, the biggest difference and that's why I dedicate this channel, that's why I dedicate what I do at Simple Programmer to helping developers in, in other areas of life, especially in soft skills, because that is so, so important, especially as, as more and more development jobs become commoditized, this is gonna become more and more important. So pay attention here and make sure that you do that if you wanna be able to compete in this global marketplace. So I got this email from Raj, and Raj is a pretty dang cool name, by the way. I just, I like that name. If I think, I think if I were in India, I would go with Raj. So should I choose to work for cheap on technologies? Uh, wind forms image processing, which will have very less impact on my career, or learn technologies, and he's got ASP.NET, MVC, Angular, JS with high demand in market and continue job search. So the way I'm interpreting this question is he's basically saying, hey look, I can get a job doing wind forms development or, or doing, what else did he put here? You know, something that's not as valuable, image processing, I think image processing is, is valuable, uh, which will have not much impact on the career because it's, you know, wind form development. Who's using that anymore, right? We're, we're using MFC and, and all that. Or I can continue my job search. I don't have a job right now, but I could, I could learn ASP.NET and AngularJS, something more valuable in the, in the marketplace. What should I do? Should I take the short-term money and, and work the wind forms thing and 
and, and sacrifice my future? <laughs> or should I, you know, go without a job and maybe not eat for a while and, and learn ASP.NET? So here's, here's what I would actually recommend that you do. I would recommend, you know, if you don't have a job and you don't have a buffer, take the job that you can get with the skills that you have right now, but figure out how you can start transitioning in that job to more updated skills, right? So if you know you can get a WinForms job like this tomorrow, then go for it, then go do it, right? And in the meantime, start learning something else, right? And try to incorporate that into your current job, right? I, I think a lot of people, and this is, I mean, we could apply this to the higher level. I think a lot of people that are out there looking for jobs, a lot of you software developers right now, because I know because I get emails from you, you're like, well, I want to do this but I'm not getting that job or I don't have that perfect opportunity or, or you're even, you know, you, you're working, you've got some experience in retail or some other area and you're like, oh, well, this is beneath me. I want to be a software developer now, so I'm going to just be unemployed for a long time and I'm just going to keep on learning my software development. Life doesn't work that way, right? You've got to be working. You're not going to have success by just like spending all this time learning and then, and then you, you get a job and it's the perfect job that you want. A lot of times you have to create your own opportunities in life and, they, and they're going to come from unexpected places that, that you might not expect. So I would say that like don't wait. Don't just wait for this perfect opportunity. Don't wait for the perfect job that may not come along. I mean be specific. Be targeted in your job search. But mostly you know, this advice goes to someone who already has a job. If you don't have a job, don't be picky, right? Be willing to do whatever you need to do to get by to, in, in the meantime. And it's going to take some extra work. It's going to take some extra hours that you're going to have to devote some extra time studying and learning something else. And maybe you can incorporate it into your job. There's always ways to do it that I found, right? When I was working as a developer, and maybe this, maybe this will help you more than anything else. So take that WinForms job and, and figure out how to build some tools using ASP.NET or ASP.NET MVC or whatever you, whatever technology or AngularJS that, that you can use at the company. And, and, and I, I use this technique myself a lot. So I worked for a lot of companies that were using outdated technologies, right? I worked for like HP and Xerox and companies that, and, and also for government systems where they had really, actually government systems was probably the best one, where they had really outdated technologies. They were not on the cutting edge at all. I guess maintain these old systems. But you know what I, I did is there's always a need for developer tools. There's always a need for tools that make the developer's job or the team's job easier, right? All kinds of business processes and things that you have that uh, you've, got to, you've got to automate in some way or that can, they can help developers to, to do their job better, right, that are on your team. And so what you can do is you can build those tools in those technologies. So I was working for this one uh, contract position at a at a government job and we had again an old antiquated system that was this old Java system and you know not using any of the newest and greatest stuff so what did I do I started building a tool that made it so that a build tool that made it faster for us to do the build of the system but what technology did I use to do that I used the latest ASP.NET MVC web development technology to do that okay I had a similar job at HP and we had this old tool that we were maintaining and ASP.NET was coming out just at that time and so I created a, a test tracking software to help internal an internal tool not the actual product that we we're selling and I created an ASP.NET MVC so use that technique in order to to uh, to move yourself over to the new technologies where you're still going to get paid to do this and it's still going to be valuable and you, in the meantime you don't have to be hungry looking for a job because you're looking for that perfect ASP.NET job which you don't even have the skills yet. You can be developing those skills while you're getting paid and, and actually pretty, providing value to your team and to your employer. So take the WinForms job is my advice and, and hey, and, and learn the ASP.NET by creating some tools on the side. How to become a self-taught developer or becoming a self-taught developer, teaching yourself to code, however you want to phrase it. I, I don't have a specific question, but I get asked this a lot. And I'm, I'm going to make this video too because I'm getting a lot of pushback from some of you that I'm promoting coding boot camps. I've got a book the Complete Software Developer's Career Guide. And I actually in that book, I, I give you the three paths. I say college, self-taught, and bo boot camp. And I give you the pros and cons of each one, right? And so am I a little bit biased towards the, the boot camp? Yeah, but 
but that doesn't mean that self-taught isn't a good way to go. It's just that the only reason why I recommend boot camp over self-taught is because it provides you a little bit of structure and it sort of cuts out the noise. So, but I want to tell you if you do want to become a self-taught software developer, how you can do that because it's 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 basically what I did, okay? And it's it's definitely possible, especially today. Okay, so so here's the thing. Okay, Let, let's start from from the very beginning on how to do this. The very first thing that you want to do is you want to figure out, okay? You want to figure out what it is exactly that you want to accomplish, right? Because a lot of this is a mistake, right? I coach a lot of developers, okay? By the way, if you want my coaching, uh, you can you can check it out at simpleprogrammer.com forward slash coaching. All right, it's it's expensive, but I, I don't need to. I don't need a personal coach. I could just tell you this if this is if this is what you're trying to do. Okay, so a, a lot of developers that I'm coaching, one of the biggest mistakes that they make is that they're trying to learn so many different things and they're scattered in their approach. Right? I talk about this a lot, but this is really really important. If you're going to be self-taught, the, the key thing is focus and discipline. Right? This is why that it doesn't work out for a lot of people, especially today because there's a lot of distractions, there's a lot of noise, there's like squirrel over there, right? So in order to, to do this, you gotta start with a very, very clear goal in mind, right? And there's so many different things you could learn, so many technologies. So what I want you to do is I want you to work backwards and I want you to go and pick a job description for the kind of job that you would like. Maybe you do some research and kind of get some general idea of what kind of field, what kind of technologies you'd like to use. But once you figure that out, then you go and you look for jobs, okay? And you look at the job descriptions and you see what they have in common. You see what technologies and, and languages, like what would it take to get this job? Instead of, because see, if you're looking to become a software developer, that's a very amorphous term. What does it mean to become a software developer? When are you, when have you arrived, right? But if you say, I would like to get this kind of a job, that's a better question, right? But if you say, I would like to get this specific job, what would it take for me to get this exact job, okay? Now we've got somebody, and now you could even call up the hiring manager, you know, you could just say, hey, you know, what, what would it take to get this job, <laughs> right? Or you can call someone at the company, or you can email them or ask them and say, hey, you know, I'm not applying for this job right now, I'm not ready. But I just want to know, like, if I were trying to get this job, what would I need to know exactly? Like, I read the job description. I have some questions about the job description, right? What would I need to know exactly? Like, if I knew this, this, and this, would that be, like, what you're looking for? You see what I'm saying? You might even be able to get them on a Skype call or a phone call and get them to, to give you some of that information. Now you've got somewhere to go, okay? Now you've got a goal in mind. Another way to do this would be to say, like, let's say that you want to be able to build an app, okay? Well, if you, if you, if you think, okay, I want to be able to build an Android app and I want it to be able to do this stuff and you envision or, or you see an app out there that's already an app store and say, I want to be able to create that. That's a goal. Now you can work backwards from there. So from there, now you work backwards and you have a skill set. You know exactly what you need to learn. Okay, and now you can make a plan to learn that. Okay, and so that's that's what's key. I know this does, is not is not pretty, right? And it's not maybe what you want to hear. You want to explore all these different technologies and learn all this stuff. But that's how you do it. That's how you get, become a self-taught software developer. And that's where you start. That's not where you finish. Okay, I'll give you a couple of resources. One of them, my favorite resource, is Pluralsight. You can check it out here. I've, I'm an author on the site. I did 55 courses for them, and I taught on a ton of topics. So you can find a lot of courses. I mean, for like 30 bucks a month. I think is what it costs now. You can get access to like thousands of courses. Just sign up for that so that you can you can have the resources that you need. Um, obviously, books, right? You know, my book, The Complete Software Developer's Career Guide, talks about all this: getting started as a software developer, getting your first job, all of these things. So, if you want to become a self-taught software developer, you probably want to get want to get that as well. And there's tons of YouTube tutorials and, and free stuff out there. Uh, you know, one one resource a lot of people have been recommending is uh, is Free Code Camp, right? Which has a ton of it's, it's basically self-taught, right? It's not really Code Camp because you're self-teaching yourself, right? You're getting a little bit more guidance. But there, there's plenty of resources. I don't, I don't really need to recommend the resources. And instead, like I said, the key thing is just focusing on having that goal. And then I'll tell you, once you do that, and once you have the skills required, and you start applying for those jobs, and you finally get that that job, it's not done. Now you go and you fill in the rest of the stuff. Now is where I'd start to learn some of the computer science stuff and the algorithms. And now is where I would start to like broaden my skill set a little bit, right? You want to have what they call as a T-shaped knowledge, where you have it's like a T, you have really deep 
knowledge in one area, but you've got a broad base, right? First get the deep knowledge in one area so that you can get the job, so you can get the, you're going to learn a lot from just having a job and actually working in the industry, and then you broaden that base out and maybe you can pick more specialties that you're going to go into. But becoming a self-taught developer is, it's not the easiest thing in the world, right? And it's mostly because of the noise. We've got so much information out there, you've just got to be able to sort through the information and the, the best way to do that is just to have an objective, right? If you have a target, you're going to be able to aim at that target and you're going to know, it's still going to be hard, you're still going to have to learn, you're still going to have to you know, devote the time, but that's going to get you closer and closer to the goal because you're going to know which direction you're supposed to move, right? This is, and like I said, I, I could give you all kinds of you know, pieces of advice on, on how to do this, but if you just do this one thing, you'll figure it out. If you have an actual target and you actually have a goal, and like I said, you're trying to become a developer to get that job or to build that app, then you're going to know which way to go. And if you need some help along the way, you know, if you want to invest in some coaching, I could coach you on help along the way. That would be more valuable than me just telling you to pick a damn goal, right? Because that's, most people don't focus, right? And, and pick a goal, but try it first. If you're having trouble, if you want to become a self-taught developer, pick the goal and see if you can figure it out. Most people will be able to figure it out on your own. It might take you a year. It might, some people, it takes six months to get a job, honestly. Like I've got plenty of success stories on my channel where people have done that. So, you know, but I also know people that have spent four years studying and they're not quite ready yet because they're, they keep on switching technologies and they don't have a goal. They just think that someday they're gonna be, just feel like they're a software developer and they can start applying for jobs. That's not gonna happen. Accept a job with no pay for a whole year. And before you think this is a little bit crazy, let me uh, let me read you the question. This is from Semi, or S S Sammy? I think it's probably Semi. And he says, does it make sense to work for a startup that will not pay me anything for a whole year, but promises equity, I would be the only technical founder? A nice, short, and sweet question. So you guys, when you ask me questions, you should ask a nice, simple question that I can read easily, and then you're more likely to get a response or a, a video created. So, you know, this is this is definitely one of those things where I have a I have a pretty strong opinion on. Well, first of all, you got to think about joining a startup sort of like like a lottery ticket, okay? There's a high probability that you're going to lose. More than likely you're going to lose, right? When you think about it, right? If if you were, let's say, an investment banker, right? Or a venture capitalist, okay? You would not put all your money into one startup. Why? Because you know that you're probably going to lose the money, right? That's why it's a highly risky thing to do. What do VCs do? Okay, besides picking good companies, I mean, they, they go through that process. They take, maybe they have $10 million, right, to invest, and they put $1 million in 10 different companies, okay, because they're expecting that one of those companies, when it hits big, it's going to return them $100 million or $50 million, but they're expecting to lose $9 million on the other ones, right? And sometimes they lose all 10. So if you think about it, right, if you think about, always think about from the perspective of the wisest guy in an industry or the person who either has the most to risk or most to lose, right? And that's the person who's bankrolling the operation. They got, they got the money. So what are they doing and what are they betting on? So if they don't think that any particular company is going to survive, right? If they're, if they're never so sure, right? Have you ever heard of a VC just taking a hundred million dollars investing in one company that's it and they're just betting it all on that, everything they got? It doesn't happen, right? So if they don't think that it's a good idea, you shouldn't either. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't necessarily take this job. So here's the thing, this is what I'm, I'm talking about here. Don't, don't take the deal on the promise of equity and don't, don't assume that what's gonna happen is that you're gonna work for a year, you're gonna build up equity in this company, you're not gonna get paid, and it's gonna be this huge, great investment, and then you're gonna make millions of dollars. Chances of that happening, maybe less than 1%, right? I mean, let's be honest here. Maybe it's maybe you think it's more, it doesn't matter. It's nowhere, it's not even close to 50, 50%. Let's put it that way. It's not even close to 50, 50%. You can execute correctly, you can do everything right, you can have a perfect team and still fail in the business world, right? There's a certain matter of luck involved as well in a company doing well, a startup really g going crazy, okay? So too many people have lost their dreams and, and hopes on that, but Again, I'm not gonna say that you shouldn't take the job, but if you do take the job, here's why you take the job. For the experience, for the apprenticeship, right? So you need to evaluate this not in terms of 
what am I gonna make? How much money am I gonna make? Am I gonna become rich? Because there's, there's no such thing as, as get rich quick, right? There's, there's, it's not gonna happen, right? You're not gonna you know, work this one job and then assume that you're gonna become rich from this, right? That's the wrong attitude to have and you'll be shooting for, you'll, you'll be not getting the best out of the experience. But, but here's the thing, okay? If this is a good opportunity, right? If this is something where you wanna see what it's like to work for a startup, you wanna you know, get that experience and, and maybe you wanna start your own startup someday, right? Or you, this is your dream. You want to keep on working for startups, and maybe you're going to work for them for a year at a time, or whatever it is, or even it's a specific technology, right? Maybe then you want to take the job, right? So you know, again, it's we have to separate the two, right? As far as like, should you join a startup in order to get equity because you're going to make a big payday later on? No, absolutely not. Not a good investment, right? Doesn't make sense at all. Okay, you can if you were a VC and you could invest in ten, that's fine. But you're there's only one of you, okay? So so that's that's a one decision, right? Is is on the company and, and the lottery ticket there. And the second decision is the job itself, right? And so that's why I say like I would. Take Take a job, right? For example, I've said this multiple times in videos. If Warren Buffett is, says, "Hey," or you know, some billionaire says, "Hey, John, you know what? Uh, you know, I'm not going to pay you anything, but you can hang around with me all day and you can get me coffee." I'll be like, "Fuck that! I'm going to drop everything I'm doing, right? I, and, and I'm going to go and I'm going to go do it. I'm going to camp out on on Warren Buffett's lawn and say, you know, and, and bring him coffee. You see what I'm saying? Like, because I'll learn so much because the experience is so valuable. So that's the thing is you got to separate and say, okay, is the experience valuable, right? So I'm not saying never take a job that that doesn't pay you anything, right? You you should do that if the experience is worth it. It's just got to be really worth it to you, right? If it's not. Then yeah, I'm all for negotiating. You know, I, in my book, by the way, the Complete Software Developer's Career Guide. You can check it out here. I talk about how to negotiate a job, how to get your best salary, right? So I don't want you to think that I'm talking about working pro bono and that I don't think you should get paid for your work. But you gotta, you gotta weigh it out, right? You you want to always play the long game, right? What's always going to benefit you the most in the long term, okay? And that's what you want to think about this. So. You know, my opinion is, unless this is just a great job and just a great opportunity, and you're willing to work without pay and, and not get equity, assume that the company's going to go to bust. If you assume that the company's going to bust, and that that year would be worth it to you for your career and for experience or getting close to someone who has been really successful that you're going to learn a lot from, then do it. But if not, then skip this, right? Don't don't be so desperate as to to just take a job on equity. It's it's, it's a crazy move, and I, it might work. It might work, right? I mean, you 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 might be the one that proves me wrong, but. 99% of the time, more than 99% of the time, you're just going to lose everything and lose a year and not get paid for it. So, yeah, an extra degree or work experience. I think you guys know what I'm going to answer here, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read the question here. This is from Jason, and Jason says, I have a job opportunity from Amazon as a software development engineer and a bursary opportunity. I actually, I had to look up the word bursary. I, I, I didn't know what it was. Uh, to do an electrical engineering degree, which will benefit my career, which will benefit my career more. So bursary, just for you guys that are also uneducated like me, means that someone is basically giving you a paid scholarship to go to go to school. So apparently, some company is, is offering to pay for his his degree to get an electrical engineering degree, but he's already got a degree or he's graduating. He says. Some additional info, he says, I'm 19, I'm graduating from an engineering degree, majoring in game design. Man, that's cool, this year. I know this is a very niche degree. Yeah, but it's pretty freaking cool. <laughs> the bursary is from a company which also does software development, but isn't as well known as Amazon. My hesitation with taking the degree is that I then have to work for this company afterwards, which means the opportunity from Amazon will have to be postponed at least another four years. When you say postpone at least another four years, it means it may not exist. So let's let's be honest here. As an important note, the degree I'm graduating from this year allows me to complete electrical engineering in only an additional two years. This means I'll have two degrees at the end of my five years. My current degree has taken me three years. Thanks for all the help, John. P.S. I'm from South Africa. If that's of any use to you, no, but I'd like to visit someday. Now I'll get all the emails saying, "Come visit me in South South Africa." Okay, uh, I. Here, here's what I'd say about this. Okay, so the bursary thing is is interesting, but you you don't want to have a bunch of degrees on your on your wall. What what you want to have is is money. 
<laughs> what I mean by this is like, the degrees are not going to matter. You know, you got a degree. Great. That's, that's fine. Uh, you know, you really don't even need a degree to be a software developer at this point. If you got a degree in game design, that's pretty good. That is a pretty niche degree, but you probably, I think, I mean, like my perception is if you've got a degree in game design, you're probably, probably a good developer, right? Like someone who just has a CS degree, okay, you know, that's great, but game design, that says I will hire you for anything. One, one because you probably had to do a lot more complex mathematics because game development is harder than regular development for the most part, and two, because it's cool. <laughs> And uh, and I like to hire people that are cool. Now, you know, I mean, people are going to actually be interested in that. It's, it's 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 kind of a nice thing to have, actually, because people will literally hire you. I, I have gotten hired for a job before. One of my first jobs I got hired for was because the guy that was interviewing me for the job, he said, "Have you ever played EverQuest?" And I said, "No, but I'm really interested in playing EverQuest." He's like, "So you think you'd play EverQuest? We play EverQuest." And I was like, "I." I will, I will build my own PC and play EverQuest. And he's like, you're hired for the fucking job. So <laughs> it, it didn't go exactly like that, but it was pretty damn close. Like I basically got hired because I was willing to play EverQuest. Po possibly a bad decision in my life playing EverQuest, although I did have fun, but you know, hours gone of my life that I'll, I'll never get back into, that, into the black hole. So yeah, it was, it was a interesting experience but but yeah but people will just hire you for that so I'm going way off topic but but here's the thing okay so let, let's talk about about what this opportunity is you've got your degree it's game design you have an opportunity to work for Amazon uh, Jeff Bezos is kind of a slave driver you can check out the book review I did on the everything source so you might actually want to check that out before you go and work for Amazon because it's definitely a harsh work environment from what I understand and everyone I've talked to there I could be wrong, but that's you know that's that's what I've heard. I've never been to Amazon and been whipped uh, by anyone there. So you know, if I do visit, if if you know, if you guys want to give me a tour of Amazon and, and whip me, uh, just send me an email. I'll be I'll be glad to zoom on over there and 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 you can do you know whatever you want. So, in all seriousness, though, I, I don't I don't really see any benefit to you having your degree paid for, <clears throat> missing the op the Amazon opportunity when you already have a degree and then having to go work for this other company that's not as good and they're probably not gonna pay you as much because they don't have to pay you as much because they you're obligated to work for them, right? So I would totally just take the Amazon job. I mean, check out Amazon, like I said, and make sure you're willing to get involved in that work environment and if you are, then take that job, don't worry. Like having multiple degrees hanging on your wall, it, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be cool. I mean, when, when you have people over and you're like, look, I have a game design degree and here's my electrical engineering degree. And then they're like, oh, that's, that's great. It, but it's not gonna really help you in your career. Not really, I mean, who cares? Like, do you, you're gonna look at a resume and be like, oh, well, he's got two degrees. So I guess we should pay him twice as much. Doesn't happen, right? It, it, it's gonna be your skill. It's gonna be what you actually can do. And you know, if you've already got this opportunity, you're 19, you got the chance to work at Amazon, that's a good resume builder. Put that freaking thing on your resume and, and call it done. I don't think there's really a decision to, to make here in, in my mind. William says, uh, what should I spend my time? Or he says, what is the best path to achieve a good career? What should I spend my time doing to make sure I am prepared for any future career? Should I be focusing my efforts on learning and managing the top languages like JavaScript or Node, uh, JavaScript or Node.js, or should I get some experience behind me making programs or portfolios of the languages I am familiar with? Uh, I am 15 year old secondary school student living in the UK. So this is, I mean, this is crazy to answer this question at, at, at 15. Like, you're so, it's so good that you're thinking this far ahead. I, I am really impressed. I, I, I love this. You know, my, my hat is off to you. I, I really commend you on, on, on this way of thinking. I wouldn't worry too much about learning the new hottest technology. I mean, you're 15, okay? I would more worry about creating the portfolio. I mean, make, given those two choices, create the, the portfolio, create the apps that you're, are in the languages you're already familiar with, okay? Uh, I always say this, and I'll, I'll say it again, I'll say it so many times that you guys will get sick of it, but learn X to do Y. So don't learn JavaScript and Node.js just because they're the hot and cool stuff and you feel like that'll help you the most in the future. Seems like a good reasonable reason, but if you're not actually gonna build something with it, 
then learning it will not only be more difficult, but it'll be a waste of time. And, and you don't know. I mean, by the time that, I mean, I don't know when you're looking to, to join the professional development world, but maybe you're going to go to college, maybe you're not. But, you know, three years from now, you'll be 18, maybe you, you become a developer or you, you go into your career then. Node.js might not be around. I mean, JavaScript might not be around. I mean, JavaScript will probably be around, unfortunately. But, uh, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you, do, you can't predict that. But what will be valuable is having a portfolio, right? I don't know what language that you're, you're developing in, maybe it's C-sharp or Java or, or something. I mean, if it's some obscure language that's, that's really, you know, like something like VB script or something like that, okay. In that case, yeah, learn something else, and, and, but, but still build a portfolio, build the apps, right? This is going to be the thing that's going to be more impressive, right? So think of it this way. Let's say that, you know, three years down the road, you, you're trying to get a job. And a prospective employer, you've got no experience, right? Because you're, you're 15. I mean, you're going to be pretty impressive just, just by how much that, that you have. But you go in and let's say they have two options, you know, three, two paths of life that you could choose. In one path of life, you decide to use whatever languages that you, you've got and you build this portfolio. You build like six or seven apps over the next three years. You got a couple of them in the app store. You're actually making some money from the apps and you've got some web applications up there. You've got the source code. You can demonstrate these apps to people. You've, you've got that on your resume, all this stuff that you've built. Or you've got a resume that says that you learned Node.js and you haven't really built anything. Maybe you've got one app and you've played around with it and you spent this, this time learning Node.js and JavaScript. Which is going to be more valuable, right, to the employer, right? Which one are they going to say, oh, this guy's more competent and I should hire this guy, right? To, to me, it's always, fun it's always function, right? I, I talk about this idea that the only credentials that matter to me are, are the ones of of, of success, of, of what you actually accomplish, of action, of, of what you of what you have done in the world, right? It doesn't matter if you have a PhD, it doesn't matter if you know all this stuff or, or technology, it's like what have you actually done? What what have you actually accomplished? Okay? And so that's, that's the credentials that I care about. And not everyone is like that, but the people that you want to work for are going to be like that, and that, that's what's, what's going to matter most. So go out there and do stuff. Build applications. Uh, get your portfolio built up. That's going to be way more beneficial than just learning some technology and kind of picking it at random. Now, if you've got it, you're going to build an application with Node and, and JavaScript and you go, want to go that direction, totally cool, but go that direction. The worst thing you could possibly do, I'm telling you right now, that you're, you're 15 is to spread out and try to learn everything that you have the temptation to do that and you feel like you got to learn all this stuff because it's all out there don't specialize right now pick something go deep with it it's going to be so much you want to be the doogie hauser right I, I'm, I'm dating myself but you want to be the the doogie hauser that's where where people are like man this guy's a kid genius at, at the medical profession or, or whatever it is right you want them to be like thinking of that of you not that you're just a generalist and, and you can program in 15 different programming languages that's not nearly as as beneficial as someone who's actually built real applications in one programming language. That's always going to be way, way more beneficial than, than the theoretical, than the, just the academic exercise. All right, so congratulations, I mean, just for, for, for what you're doing already. Keep going down the path. It's not always going to be fun, I'll tell you that. You know, you're, you're young, but, but keep going, right? The, everything that is worthwhile in life is going to be difficult, but that's what makes it worthwhile. So I got a question about automation in AI, but it's not really about that. It's more about, it's more about being afraid of the future, which is something that this is a reoccurring theme that I've found from a lot of software developers. I did some videos on AI, which, you know, is AI coming to take my job and, and all this. I think I did a couple of videos because this is a reoccurring theme, but I'm going to do another one here from a little bit of a different angle, just because this is, is such a fear. I, I'm surprised that this is such a fear. This is from Anita, and he says, in India, one company fired 6K employees, then another company fired 9K employees due to automation and AI. I'm worried about my future as software developer. Can you please suggest how I should look at the situation positively and keep going forward? Whatever we are learning today, will it turn to value zero tomorrow due to change in technology? Which technology should I learn to make a secure future? Currently, I'm working on Java technology. Please advise. 
So here's what I got to say, all right? I heard a really powerful thing from someone I highly respect. I was at a, a Tony Robbins seminar as I've changed a lot of, of how I present myself and how I think about life it, for, from that moment forward. I mean, I think you could see a drastic change in my life. And he said something, I've talked about this a, a lot of times, but I'll say it again because it's so powerful. He, he, he said, the quality of your life is in direct proportion to the amount of uncertainty you can comfortably live with. And what I realized at that point when I heard him say that was that my entire life was built around creating certainty. It was built around creating an impenetrable fortress so no one could hurt me, so I could secure my future and nothing bad could happen. And that took all the joy out of life. It really did. And I was really sealing myself into my own coffin, you, you could say, right? In, in, impenetrable coffin. No one can get to me, but I can't get out either. And, and there's so little value left in my life and, and, and joy when, when, when I do that because the future has to be uncertain, right? And so you can spend a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to secure yourself against the future. And I'm not saying being an idiot. I'm not saying being stupid. I'm not saying don't like think ahead and, and make wise decisions, right? I'm all about delayed gratification and, and long-term decision making, right? My, my life is, is in some way based on that, you could say. But you can't be driven by fear and you have to be willing to embrace whatever comes, even though you do your best. I mean, you train, right? You train for the battle. But you're willing to go into the battle. You don't train just for the sake of training. You train for the battle, but you're willing to realize that despite your training, despite whatever plan that you have, right? As, as what is it? Mike Tyson says, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face, all right? You're going to get punched in the face. Don't try and avoid getting punched. You can't be a boxer in the boxing ring and your strategy is I'm never going to get punched. That's a bad strategy. It's a horrible strategy. It's a horrible way to live your life. That's how I was trying to live my life. And that's what you're telling me you want to do here right now. You're like, hey, John, tell me what technology that I can invest in that is future proof. Tell me what thing is going to make it so I'm never going to get laid off in my, in my life so that I'm always secure, that there's never a problem. I don't know. I can't tell you. Even if I did, right? I mean, what would that, is that, was that really valuable to you? Right? You might think it is, but no. If, if you knew for certain that you were going to get a certain paycheck for the rest of your life and never have to worry again, it seems like a great thing. But there would be no excitement. There would be no joy. There would be no variability in that. And you would actually end up losing some of the value of life. So what can I say here? This is my best wisdom on this that I would tell you. Plan for the future, but do that by making yourself adaptable as much as possible. Focus, if you're going to learn things, teach yourself how to learn. I've got a course on how to teach yourself how to learn. It's called 10 Steps to Learn Anything Quickly. You can check it out here. You know, that's, that's one thing that you can do is prepare yourself for the future by, and you don't have to buy my course, but make sure that you are adaptable. Make sure that you are the kind of person that can roll with the punches, that knows how to adapt, that focuses on the higher level principles and is able to learn things quickly, is able to grasp concepts quickly, is able to jump into things that uh, new things and, and be comfortable being uncomfortable. That, that, focus on that. So that's number one. Two, focus on what is obviously long-term investments in your future, delayed gratification type of things. Have some money saved up, right? I did this video on not being in a squeeze, all right? Avoiding the squeeze situation. It's about having some backup, having some buffer, okay? That's really important. So make wise financial decisions. Make wise decisions for the future. Make investments that will help you, that will give you a buffer, that will sort of buffet you against the waves of life and fortune so that mild misfortunes do not wreck you, okay? You can't control the earthquakes and the hurricanes of life. Those will happen. But what you don't want to have happen is that you, you have a, a mild bump in the sidewalk and it causes you to not, knock your teeth out and, and lose, you know, and, and to go on this whole train, uh, this whole chain reaction of bad things. So give yourself, you know, the, the buffer that you can. 
Don't build an entire fortress around you like I was trying to do, but, but be smart about that. And then the third thing is just to say, just embrace change and embrace the future and, and whatever comes, comes. You know, I've decided to live my life in such a way that I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna just deal with the consequences. And that's, it's, about, it's living life. Other, anything other than that is not living life, it's denying reality. If you deny reality, you're living somewhere else. Live here, and in here, you can't control fate. You can't control what's ultimately gonna happen. You just gotta accept it, and, and that's what I'd say. So, as far as the job, as far as technology, as far as AI taking over things, yeah, maybe, I don't know, what will happen? There's no guaranteed technology. But if you're doing the, the three things I described above, you will survive and you will thrive while other people are scrambling, while other people are trying to put the bricks back in their wall, while other people are trying to build themselves security when, they're in, when there is no security, right? Th those are the things that are gonna give you the inner security, that is gonna give you the inner strength that's gonna really make you strong and, and make it so you don't care what happens, you're gonna adapt to, the, to whatever situation uh, occurs because you can't predict against this stuff. And I can't tell you, I can't tell you if AI is gonna make your job disappear. What I can tell you is there are always gonna be jobs and there's always gonna be people that are valuable because they contribute, because they figure out the way, they look at the current market, the current landscape, and they figure out how to create value for other people within that. And that's what you have to be, not the kind of person that tries to predict the future.